All right, hey everybody, welcome to Rooftop Leadership Leading Through the Churn. This is the webinar that you've been waiting for. This is the webinar on how to lead through the churn. And what we're gonna do is as we're waiting for folks to jump in here, uh, I'm gonna see if Mark, if you're able to open the chat room, I don't know if you are uh, on your screen, uh, but I'd love to see, I'd love to see that it's just there to the right. Yep, I'd love to see the chat room open. Uh, maybe we can just kind of move that slide over, you know, kind of grab it, move it over to the side. Uh, there we go. And so as this thing is populating, what I would ask you to do, if you don't mind, is go ahead and put in the chat box your name uh, and where you're from, right? And we'd love to hear your comments throughout tonight's webinar. It's super important that the whole idea here is having a conversation around the importance of community. That's one thing as a former Green Beret that I've learned is that community is at the epicenter of everything that we're gonna do, all right? So it's so good to see old friends popping in here like Jim and Greg Smith, but I'm also seeing new people. So as this thing populates, please put your name in here and where you're dialing in from, right? Let us know what you do for a living and, and where you lead. I think that's super important. Now what I'm gonna do as we're, we're moving into this leading through churn webinar while it's populating, we're gonna do a, a, a little thing we call Poll Everywhere. And Jamie Dunn, our marketing lead, is gonna talk you through how to do that. But it's super important that we hear from you on this. It's really easy. And we're gonna do it a couple of times tonight. So just follow Jamie's instructions and we'll start knocking the first one out right now. Jamie, over to you. Hey everyone. Um, I'm gonna ask you right now while I am sharing my screen to go to pollev.com slash rooftop L118. The question there is where is trust broken the most in your life? And that just means, you know, where are you seeing the biggest trust gaps? Is it in your personal relationships? Is it at work? Is it in your community? Do you think it's with the government, the media? Where do you feel in your personal life uh, where trust is most broken? So if yep. you could go to pollev.com slash rooftop L118. You can go ahead and input your answers there. Yeah, and this, thanks, Jamie. And this is a really cool function, you all, because if we're really going to have a meaningful conversation around leading through the churn, then it's really important that we start to get a sense from you of what you're seeing on trust in your arena. Right. So what I would ask is think about your arena right now. Okay. The arena where you compete the arena where you live, the arena where you operate on a daily basis. It could be in your community. It could be at your business. It could be on social media. It could be uh, in politics. We're seeing government here. So let me explain what's happening to you as you're watching this. This word picture is populating based on not just the responses that are coming in, but also on the, the magnitude of the responses. In other words, right now, a lot of people are saying they have issues with trust in the government. A lot of people are saying they have issues with trust in the media. That's disproportionately larger than things around family and leadership and things like that. Now we're seeing politics start to populate here. But the whole idea, you all, is I just want to get a collective view of where you feel trust is most broken in your life right now. This is just a diagnostic look because humans are emotional creatures. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. So this feel statement that we're doing right now helps us get a collective sense of the emotional temperature of this group of leaders, right? And as you see this thing populate, understand that the people in this room right now are different ethnicities. They are different religions. They are different socioeconomic status. They are different disciplines. The rooftop leadership community, one thing I will tell you that defines us is our diversity. We come from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of uh, different groups, but look at what's happening on the screen right here. What you're starting to see is a populated perspective from all of that diversity and, and the magnitude of some of the trust issues that are starting to pop up. And you're gonna see themes that are gonna happen throughout the, throughout the night right now, you're, but you are seeing evidence of trust broken in your community. You're seeing it in the, in, the, in, the, in the law enforcement. You're seeing it personally. There actually is a lot of uh, emphasis in here at personal levels on agencies, local society, friendships. So what's happening is don't just read government as the only thing. 
uh, everyone's just using different words to describe their local arena. Take a look there through that lens. That's really important, right? Because if you look, you're seeing there are quite a few local dynamics at play as well where trust is broken, okay? So I think this should serve to really give us a decent picture of where we are, okay? So let's drop that screen right there. Um, that'll help us, you know, now you've got, now we've got a sense of each other, right? Now we've got a sense of where we are at an emotional level around this thing called trust. And I think it's safe to say that there are definitely some issues uh, with trust in the world today. And that's what I call the churn, okay? All of those things that you saw listed uh, on that screen, that's what I call the churn. It is this turbulent human conflict that is at play and it's always been at play in human dynamics, but today it is particularly pronounced. So how do we lead through it? And that's what I'm here. That's what we're here to help you think through tonight. That's the purpose of this leading through the term webinar. And the reason that I believe this matters to you, at least I hope that it matters to you, is that we've had, and I'm going to show you on the whiteboard behind me, a lot of challenges with the churn in the entire human existence. It's gotten particularly pronounced over the last several decades, but in the last six months, it has accelerated to alarming degrees, the churn. And in the next six months, I believe we are facing potentially cataclysmic situations at various organizational levels to include our, our, our country uh, and other countries from people who are watching this outside the United States, all right? So we are at a strategic crossroad in how we operate as leaders and the organizations that we lead. If you're in here and you're a business leader or a business owner, if you're in here and you're a senior leadership team member or you manage people, if you're in here and you're a community volunteer or you are in here to advance an underrepresented voice, then you're in the right place because we are at a strategic crossroad right now where we could face organizational challenges that are unprecedented in your life and mine. And that's what we're here to talk about. That's why this matters to you. Uh, and again, our purpose tonight is to talk about how we lead through the churn. In other words, how do we overcome the social tension that is getting in the way of your goals and the people you serve in your arena? How do we overcome that social tension? That's where we're going to focus our effort. Now, I've outlined um, several objectives for us tonight. And what you're going to find is this, this is an, an ambitious hour that we have. And I'm really going to try to hit an hour on this. But what I will tell you is if I go past an hour a little bit, I'm going to keep jamming because I need to get this to you. Okay. Um, but I'm going to do my level best to hit an hour. I've outlined six objectives that I have for you tonight that I want you to hold me accountable for that I'm going to try to deliver to you. Number one is that I've, I'm going to leave you with a, a newer and deeper understanding of human terrain and human dynamics. Number two, um, is that I want to give you a new lens that you can look at your arena and see aspects of human interaction, particularly negative human interaction that we call the churn. I want to give you a new filter to look through that you can see things that before you're like, hmm, something feels weird. Now I want you to be able to look through a lens that's like, ah, that's what that is. Number three, objective number three, is I want you to leave tonight with a new language that you have, that you can communicate the problem of the churn, and more importantly, the solutions to deal with that problem at a local level, whether that is you and your senior leadership team in your business, whether that is you as a community organizer, as a media representative. But we've got a language now to talk about this at a level that is much more proficient than anything we've ever had, okay? Number four is hopefully you should have some new moves at the end of this thing that you can either start putting into play tomorrow morning, or you can start training on to get, to get ready to put into play as soon as you can, all right? Number five, objective number five, is that you have an un increased understanding of what your role is in overcoming the churn. So many people right now, friends, family, high school teachers have reached out to me, and they're all saying the same thing. What can I do? What can I do right now? I don't know what I can do. I'm not even sure what's happening, but what can I do? I want you to leave here tonight with a better understanding of the role you can play in overcoming the churn. And number six, I really hope you leave here tonight, regardless of where you operate in the world, with 
better access to a group of people who are very diverse in what they believe and what they stand for and very different than you, but we have a commonality in our passion for bridging trust and our disdain for the churn. That's what unites us. And that you've got a tribe that you can connect with on that that spans multiple tribes. Okay, so how are we going to do that? We have to talk about how we're going to lead through this. This is not going to be, we're going to have to work tonight. This isn't just you sitting back casually. Like this is you leaning in and we're going to have to work. For me, here's what, here's what my commitment is to you. I'm going to give you all I've got on this knowledge set in an hour. At times I'm gonna sprint, at times I'm gonna pull back and try to let it breathe, at times I'm gonna build, and I'm always gonna to try to stay connected to what you care about. I'm gonna give you my perspective, my experience as a Green Beret and a combat advisor who has worked in dozens of low trust, violent places around the world, and I'm gonna give you my best perspective, objectively, on what it takes to create environments where you overcome the churn when trust is low. Okay, sound fair? Uh, that's what I'm really gonna push for. Um, also, uh, I'm gonna give you my, my coaching. I'm a rapport coach, a connection coach. I do it with Green Berets in training. I do it with high-performing business leaders. I'm gonna coach you the same way. I'm gonna tell you what you need to hear, not what you wanna hear. That's my promise to you. Um, and then I'll give you my scars and mistakes. I'm gonna share the mistakes I made along the way. And I'm going to use the whiteboard. It's out of focus right now. Don't worry about that. It will come in focus as I get closer uh, to co-create with you. We'll also pull up PowerPoint slides. <laughs> Hate those things, man. But I'm going to pull them up just at times so that you can stay caught up with us. And uh, what I need from you is this. I need you to be intellectually honest, right? You're in here right now to have a conversation about how to lead through the churn. I'm asking you, to set your biases at the door. Whatever your political affiliations are, whatever burns in your heart to, to push back against or to, to defend, just set it aside for a second and open your heart, open your mind to a potential framework, process, and methodology that will help inform what it is that you stand for and have a much better chance of fulfilling on it. Sound fair? Does that sound like something we can do? And then the last thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to co-create with me. Jamie sent out uh, today uh, in the Zoom email, uh, a PowerPoint deck that you can print out if you wanna have someone do that right quick. I mean, I'm sorry we didn't get it to you sooner. We've been jamming to get ready. But we'll also put up a filled out PowerPoint slide at different points in the show tonight. And those will also go out in the show notes. So you'll have the opportunity to go back and listen to this and really fill it out because I think it's a framework that you can use to inform what you do. Okay, does that sound like a way we can play? All right, I'm gonna assume that's right. I'm gonna assume that there's north and south head nods going all over the country and all over the world. So we're gonna jump into it. Uh, and by the way, right now we're looking at like close to 150 people in this webinar right now. So leaders all over the country are leaning in on this. And that is, that is super, super exciting. And continue to put your name uh, and your, where you live in here and put your comments in here because we'll go back and read them. If you have questions, we'll go back and address them. That's my promise to you. All right, so the first thing that, that I'm gonna jump into here is I wanna I want get into the, the, the fact that it is extremely difficult to, to, to lead through the churn, right? Um, and, and in order to show you this, I need you to come back with me to Afghanistan, 2004, okay? In Afghanistan in 2004, uh, I, it was my first deployment to Afghanistan as a Green Beret. I had worked mostly in Central and South America. Now, you need to understand that at this point, um, uh, the U.S.-led coalition had been in Afghanistan for several years after the attacks of 9-11. Uh, a small number of Green Berets and other special operators had pushed Al-Qaeda out of the country. The Taliban was on the run in Pakistan. And then this massive U.S.-led coalition, over 100,000 troops came in, uh, U.S.-led NATO coalition, and started working with local Afghans to rebuild the country. Now, one of the things that was so significant about that was when my SF battalion Green Berets arrived in southern Afghanistan in 2004, we were on the eve of the first ever presidential election in that country. Now understand Afghanistan, one of the poorest countries on, on earth, had lived for centuries under monarchy and most of the rural folks didn't have a say about anything, right? And then after that monarchy, the Soviets came in in the 70s, 
dominated that country for several decades, unended their whole way of life in terms of tribal dynamics. That was followed by a civil war where warlords from all the different ethnic groups warred against each other. And then you had 9-11, right? Where the US-led coalition came in and for another series of years, targeted and chased bad guys and, 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 and bad actors into these rural villages. So by 2004, we're all excited because we're gonna have a free election in the country. The Afghans, for the first time, are gonna get to vote for their national president. Now, there's so much illiteracy in the country that they, they, they don't even list the candidates with, you know, you don't vote for them by looking at, at, the, at the words. That's there as well, but it's the pictures of the candidates. You put ink on your finger, and then you put your ink mark by the picture of the candidate that you wanna elect. And man, it made all the news, right? 24 hour news cycle on both sides. You know, we're still reporting a lot of the good things happening in Afghanistan and Afghans were holding the finger up proudly with the ink on it. And it just, it, it's not only had we defeated Al Qaeda, not only had we liberated Afghanistan, but now we had a democratic partner in Southwest Asia, a hotbed of Islamist funda fundamentalism was now gonna be countered by democracy, but no. That's not exactly what was going on. That's how it played. But for the Green Berets and other combat operators working out in these rural areas, what we saw quickly was that wasn't necessarily the narrative that was being put forward at all at a local level. In fact, there were a whole bunch of local rural Afghans who were not in favor of the election, who actually viewed the, the election as a threat to their way of life. And the Taliban was actually pulling the thread on this election narrative as a direct threat to the centuries old way of life in Afghanistan. Now, if you'll stay with me, if you'll hang in there and listen to this, you'll understand and I'll be able to walk you through a lot of the stuff that's happening in our country today because there's nothing new under the sun. So what was it that actually was going on below the surface that, that caused so many Afghans to actually balk and, 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 and pull back from this free election process, right? Well, first of all, I will tell you that in Afghanistan, that is primarily known as a bonding trust society, bonding trust. Now, in this webinar, we're gonna get deeper on trust than, we've probably, than you've probably ever gotten. And I'm gonna introduce some language that I have created over about 10 years of research and work in human dynamics that I think will color how you approach the trust issues that you typically look at and you're like, oh, that's something wrong with that, but I don't understand it. This will give you some language to speak to it. And this first phrase is bonding trust. That's what was going on in Afghanistan. We didn't understand that at the time, but let me try and break down to you what bonding trust basically is. It's the oldest form of trust in the arena, right? And what it basically is, is you have different groups, okay, that are essentially, competing for scarcity, for resources to survive. And this is true of all mammals, right? So in a bonding trust environment, the driver of behavior, what causes people to take action is resource scarcity and status, your status within your group and the status of your group in the context of other groups. And the reason is very simple. This is an area where there isn't enough to go around. Right? So humans have to forage, they have to gather, they have to hunt, they have to fight and actively compete, just like other mammals, to have what they need. And so these different groups are actually what evolve in this society. Right? So what you have is a group emphasis. The group is at the epicenter of everything. These circles represent a group. So my in-group would be my mom, my dad, my brother, my cousins, maybe my neighbors, all of us who can circle wagons together and we can acquire, maintain, and obtain resources that we need to survive. And this is throughout the mammal kingdom. It's been happening for thousands of years. And that's the society that was happening here for the most part in rural Afghan society was bonding trust. You bond with the people in your group, right? It's deep, but not wide. And as a result of that, the trust is really deep inside your group. But when you start to get to the edge of the old blue circle here, what you start to experience are these little tornadoes of conflict, right? I call it the churn. And basically what that is, is the overt social tension between groups competing life and death 
for the resources they need to survive and the status that they have to maintain to stay in their group. Because if you don't maintain your status, guess what? You get bumped out of the group, you're an individual and you die, right? So those two drivers of behavior are huge, right? So what you, as a result of that, justice in this society is honor-based. You make justice is not about right or wrong. Justice is about someone doing wrong to you. And then your group is honor bound to pursue that kind of vengeance and feud to avenge it. So you can imagine this is a very deep trust, but when those groups start bumping up against each other, it is very, very unstable. And so it is unstable beyond the group boundary right and 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 again so the focus on all of this for leaders is bonding the leaders don't really care if i'm in the blue group that's my in group i don't really care what's going on in the other green groups i could care less it's not my problem and in fact they're the enemy i'm going to do what i have to do to advance the agenda of my blue group so now with all that emphasis on the group it's a little easier to imagine, isn't it, that all of a sudden this occupation force that comes in after all these 40 years of conflict and says, hi, I'm from the government. How do you like me so far? Have we got a deal for you? We're going to empower all of the individuals in your society to stand up on their own. An overt threat to a group dynamic that has survived for thousands of years based on shared struggle. Okay, so played right into the Taliban narrative. We didn't even realize it. We just drove by throwing soccer balls out the window and handing out PSYOP leaflets to vote, right? Well intended, but it didn't do the job. Now, let's talk about the society that we came from, we being the US-led coalition and other Western countries that caused us to promote this, this election in this rural area, this bonding trust area. What the, the society that we came from that was promoting this is what I call a bridging trust society, okay? Now, I borrowed those terms from Robert Putnam in his book, Bowling Alone. Robert Putnam uses, the, he's, a, he's a social scientist, groundbreaking work, you should read the book, uh, but, but he calls it bonding social, bonding social capital and bridging social capital. I just abbreviated it to trust, okay? But the society that we came from was bridging trust. Now, let me tell you what bridging trust basically means. You've lived in it most of your life. You've grown up in it, but it's an invisible truth. It's transparent to you in so many ways. So let me give some language to it. Let me give some color to it. A bridging trust society, instead of having these circular groups, what you typically see are individuals. You see all of these dots, those represent individuals. Now, Let's just say that I am one of those dots, right? And I get out of the military and I want to start a business on leadership and human connection. Well, down here in this society, I'd probably have to start that business with everybody from my tribe or clan because that's who I'm allowed to work with. And that's a pretty unstable system. But up here, I can actually bridge beyond my in-group. I can establish a business partner who might be a different ethnicity. I can establish a shipping relationship outside into the state of California. I can work with Muslims and Christians over here, and I can start to build these relationships all over the place. I can use social media to establish it, and pretty soon I've got all of these cool connections that are beyond my in-group, right? It's far beyond my in-group, and the reason is because the emphasis is on the individual. I don't have to worry about accountability to my group. Because if I tried this down here, it would be an ugly scene. Here, I am absolutely freed up to bridge however I want to do. And a big reason for that, people ask me all the time, well, why is that possible? Well, down here where you have emphasis on scarcity and status for a whole host of reasons, and these societies, you typically have a large sense of abundance. There is enough right, that you don't need the group dynamic, okay, and there is a sense of psychological safety, as Daniel Coyle says, and there is a sense of shared connection, 
and there is a sense of shared future. The three things that Daniel Coyle says in his book, The Talent Code, that high performing cultures must have. And all of those are present enough that I can bridge beyond my in-group safely. Now, a few other things have to be in place for this to work, right? The first thing is rule of law has to be in place. The state has to have a monopoly on violence, right? In places like Afghanistan and other tribal societies, right? The state does not have the monopoly on violence. Groups handle their own violence because it's honor-based justice. But up here, you have the state has to have a monopoly on violence to preserve the autonomy of the individuals, right? And if you lose that, then you can't have the bridging trust environment. So there has to be also strong leadership. You have to, because this is not a natural form of trust. This is. This is actually how humans are designed to trust. But as we have continued to move through our social evolution, there are certain societies that have this bridging trust, that have this sense of abundance, that are able to bridge beyond their in-group without recourse freely. And some of the social rewards of that are more freedom to do so. It's, I know you can't see this, I'm gonna call it out to you. Um, a collaborative outcome. So we, you know, Stuart Diamond in his book, Getting More, showed that in a Wharton study, uh, groups that practice, uh, that have bridging trust and practice diverse collaboration, four times as much value in their bottom line, right? So you have greater collaborative outcomes. These kinds of organizations that have bridging trust versus bonding trust, there's less friction. And as Stephen Covey and he said, as Stephen Covey Jr. says in The Speed of Trust, those groups move faster and they're more efficient. Their operating costs are less. There's less friction, right? So it is a pretty fair statement. Now, let me also throw this out here. I'm going to get to this in a second, but I want to show the football in a little bit. I am by no means asserting that this system is equitable or currently fair. Okay, so just keep your powder dry on that. Stay with me and listen to just the system itself, right? And if you look at those outcomes and the lack of friction there versus the heavy friction here, this starts to become a pretty strong asset for an organization. This really becomes, in my experience of working over seven years in business high performance and, and group dynamics, this is the secret sauce to moving forward at a high rate. This is what allows organizations at community level businesses and nations to fulfill on some very high level things and preserve the freedom and autonomy of individuals to pursue their dreams. So when we think about what we're leaving for our kids, when we think about what we're handing down to them, right, we need to think about which of these systems we'd like to leave them as a legacy, all right? And again, just to reiterate, bridging trust is typically around abundance. It has emphasis on the individual and what you'll find is that it is typically stable beyond the group boundaries. That's why in a lot of ways, it's you know, where the leaders are focused on bridging trust, it is a strategic asset. It is a strategic asset. It's the commodity that I'm, I'm putting forward to all of you watching this that we wanna push for, whether you're a business leader, whether you're a community leader, whether you're leading a movement, right? Creating an environment of bridging trust is actually gonna be much more conducive to meeting your strategic goals than any other movement out there, right? But it requires leaders, it requires leaders, if you could pivot to this, who have, Mark, yeah, there you go, a strategic bridging focus. You gotta be willing to bridge beyond your end group for something bigger than your group. That's the requisite that has to go along with this, okay. We've outlined two very different worlds, okay? But what I wanna to submit to you is that they're actually not different worlds at all. What I'm gonna to submit to you is that if this triangle were an iceberg, okay? And this little squiggly line right here, can we zone in on this? If this is, if this is an iceberg and this little squiggly line is the water line, then what I would say is, 
and this is all human nature right here, man. This is, this is where we all come from in this bonding trust arena. We all started here. We all started here. Our, 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 our ancestors all emerged from a bonding trust environment. And over time, certain elements of society developed mechanisms to create these bridging trust environments, nationally, regionally, organizationally, corporate, right? They're out there. But we need to understand that this one was built on the shoulders of this one. They are not distinct and separate. There's lots of elements of tribal society that are actually desirable. Uh, Sebastian Younger talks about in his book, Tribe. And we're, I'm going to quote a lot of his stuff tonight. There's a lot to learn on the positive side from these societies as well. Right? But what I'm going to show you in just a few minutes is that where we were up here in this bridging trust that so many of us grew up in and didn't even realize we were growing up in this environment of abundance and that it required leadership to maintain has actually changed dramatically. And I want to show you how it's changed. And I'm talking like, you know how, it, like in central Florida, we have these aquifers that run underground and you can't see them, but they're like water cannons shooting through the bedrock. That's the kind of change that's been happening under your feet and my feet since we were younger. And, and I'm going to show you what's happened. And now it's coming home to roost. So Mark, if you could bring the, um, actually, hold on just one second, Mark, uh, go back. And I want to go back to um, one other thing on the board here. I want to call out one more thing that is super important. Can we go back to it? All right. Zone in right here. I just want to share one more thing with you. If you've noticed lately that you are uh, losing a lot of your connection with friends uh, on Facebook, if you're seeing things happen at a local level and you're getting yourself spun up, I want to share one little quick thing with you. Humans, can you get me here, Chris, are meaning seeking, emotional, social story animals. That's just who we are. And according to Sebastian Younger and a range of other anthropologists and social scientists, we are always going to be this creature for the next 15,000 years, right? Even though we're modern and we dress better and we have all this technology, the reality is we will always below the waterline, we're going to be a tribal creature. We, we must have purpose in our life, meaning, or we will die. We are emotional. We will not take action without emotion being a factor. Emotion will, is how we navigate our world. Uh, we are social. We're wired to connect. We cannot survive without being connected. And finally, story animals. Everything we do and how we communicate is through narrative. And so as you lead, I'm kind of showing the football a little bit more. We have to realize that we're a primal creature. So if you find yourself getting pissed off on Facebook, if you find yourself going high order, at a board meeting or at a protest, and you're going to places you've never been before, let me just show you on the emotional front, we have this thing called emotional temperature, right? And, and our emotional temperature, we have, a, uh, we have a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system. And when we get elevated emotionally and aroused, we go into that primal state of, pull it here, fight, flight, or freeze. Okay, and that is the sympathetic state. We get super aroused and it's basically primal response. I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna flee, or I'm gonna freeze. That's been going on for a quarter of a million years. And then we also have a parasympathetic state, which is that calm and connect that follows those levels of arousal. Now, when we were hunting saber-toothed tigers and trying to survive in a cave, that sympathetic state would just come up for a few seconds it would serve us in battle, and then we would go back to our cave, sit around the fire, lick our wounds, tell a story, and have that parasympathetic response. Today, in modern times, we are so aroused all the time, we are so redlined all the time, that we are living in this sympathetic state of fight, flight, or freeze. And when we do that, because humans are social creatures, everyone around you is mirroring that. So now we are mirroring this sympathetic behavior back and forth. And you can see it, just look for it on Facebook, 
look for it on social media, watch people in interviews. That's what's happening. Our emotional temperatures are not regulated. We're not managing our own energy and the energy of those around us. A simple self-awareness thing we gotta know. Okay, now with that, now that we've framed both these worlds, we've got a sense of ourselves as human beings. Let's jump in, Mark, go ahead and bring up the next uh, slide. Bring up the slide that just kind of captures what we just covered, that shows um, what we just drew with bridging trust and bonding trust. Can you do that? Okay, awesome. So just take a look at that there. That's kind of the, that's kind of the finished picture of the world that we live in there, the bonding trust, the bridging trust. And then I showed you also that we're meaning seeking emotional social story animals. So we've established, go ahead and cut it back over to me now, that um, bridging trust, at least conceptually, is a pretty dynamic asset to have for organizations at any level because there's less friction and it values the individual over the group. So if that's the case, then what's happened over the last several months in particular, okay? In other words, what planet are we on, man? I get questions like that all the time. Like, what the hell is happening in our country right now? What's happening in our society? What's happening on our streets? Why are we treating each other this way, okay? And I believe there are a range of factors that because we've been in the sympathetic states, we, we've not paid attention to them. We've noticed them, but we haven't consciously noticed them. And we need to do so if we're gonna lead through it and if we're gonna have any chance at a bridging trust society again. Let me give you some of the examples that I'm seeing, maybe you're seeing them as well. I believe that Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for, are, are digital killing fields. I believe that people's uh, professional careers and reputations are just being slammed right? People are picking these digital hills to die on. If you don't like me, then unfriend me. Boom. And they're out, right? And, and massive damage is being caused at a social fabric level in these digital killing fields. Karen versus the sheep, right? Another war that's happening in our country right now. You've got people literally unfriending each other and terminating long-term friendships. There's a guy in this room right now that, that's filming that lost a long-term friend over this argument of masks or no masks right, of COVID response. An entire friendship ended virtually, right? And I'm sure you've seen the same thing. And I bet you, some of you may have even participated in those little skirmishes. Next, we have social injustice. We have the, we have the Chaz zones. We have open conflict in the streets at a level that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. I'm not looking to get into the drivers of it. I'm simply stating that there is open conflict in our streets at an unprecedented level right now. We also have Biden versus Trump. We have an election coming up that is particularly nasty. The people who are affiliating with each side are super dug in, super divided, right? And it is, it is affecting family relationships and long-term friendships. And finally, we even see discussions of democracy versus socialism on a level that we haven't seen, particularly maybe in our whole nation's history. And I just cite those as context to go, okay, What's happened? What is it that's going on that we need to pay attention to? And what's causing these kinds of social turbulences? I will tell you that starting in 1972, we started to see an insidious, subtle erosion of bridging trust in our country and in the West. We look back on it now, Robert Putnam brings this up in Bowling Alone beautifully, and he illustrates how in 1972, we started to see a range of things happen. Some of it was uh, mass media with television. Some of it was the Vietnam War, the protests surrounding the Vietnam War, Watergate, a mass move to suburbanization. And he cites about 12 or 13 things that contributed collectively to this gradual erosion of our bridging trust society. We started to see an, a, a movement away from the bridging trust piece. And, and, and as a result of that, you started to see more conflict and less bridging beyond one's end group. You started to see less e pluribus unum out of many come one. And you started to see more group dynamics where people were circling wagons back towards this. And you're like, what the hell is going on? Why would that be? 
and it got more and more pronounced over time. I started to notice it as I came back from Afghanistan and I was writing this book, Game Changers, about the, the village work we did in Afghanistan to, to turn some villages around. And I had to study trust here at home. And I was like, holy crap. As I started looking at what this was supposed to be, it was actually looking more and more like Afghanistan. And I thought, what is going on? And the reality is there is overwhelming polling data that shows starting in 1972, the United States and other bridging trust societies started to make a move away from bond, bridging trust and back into bonding trust. Remember, bonding trust is the most natural form of trust. It's what all mammals do. We're wired to actually trust that way. And so as these different factors started to happen, you started to see this movement to bonding trust, to more of the in-group, out-group dynamics, right? And, and what, what that did was it leaders, and it could be a chicken or the egg thing, we can debate this all day long, but one thing is certain, if leadership is essential to maintain this, and we've, I think we've established that it is, that this bridging trust is not possible without responsible stewarding leadership at national politics level, regional, local politics, media, uh, corporate leadership, and community leadership. Without it, you cannot maintain this fragile asset. We started to see a departure of leadership at all levels in relation to bridging trust in 1972. And the reason I can tell you that happened is first of all, there's an excellent article written by James Mattis, former Secretary of Defense on his way out the door in the Trump administration, right? Where he talks about tribalism. It's in the Wall Street Journal, we'll post it in this thread. But he talks about exactly what we're talking about here, how the United States rooted in this bridging trust culture has all of a sudden reverted back to a tribalism approach. Now, I don't use tribalism as much as Mattis does. I prefer bonding trust. I think we're on a spiral to bonding trust because I believe there's elements of tribalism that are actually good. I, and I'm gonna talk about a few of them today. There's things we can learn from it. But we did start to move from this bridging trust model to this bonding trust model. So what you started to see in your workplace, what you started to see on Fox News and CNN were all what I call these little churn twisters, right? These, come on, zoom on in on me here, right? These little twisters of conflict of, you know, do you remember in, in, in the cartoons, um, you know, when we used to um, read Charlie Brown and, and Bugs Bunny and there would be like a fight between the characters and there would be this little twister and there'd be a, a hand coming out here, a fist and a, foot over here and a head sticking out this way, a little X in the eye. Like it was a little, little twister of conflict. That's exactly what started to emanate and emerge in our arenas, in your arenas, right? And it happened so slow and so insidiously. We saw something kind of change and we'd kind of go, oh, what's going on in the world today? But we couldn't really put our finger on it, right? But what we've seen statistically is a real change in three major areas. One, is what I call distraction, right? The churn sees a ton of distraction today. The average attention span for an adult is eight seconds, according to Microsoft, right? That's one second less than a goldfish in a very controversial study. Next, we have disengagement. We're seeing disengagement across the United States at levels approaching 85%. That basically means 85% of people in the workplace today lack purpose. And we've already established that meaning is essential to survival, okay? And then finally, distrust. We've got a very high level of distrust going on in the country today. Super high level of distrust that's happening, right? And it's, it's distrust at a couple of, of levels. Let me take you there. First of all, remember we said for this to operate, the bridging trust, we said for that to operate, you have to have responsible leadership. Well, we know now that polls have shown since 1972 a plummet in the trust of politics. For example, 
in the, in the early 1970s, trust in Congress were somewhere around the high 70s. It's laughable now. It's dropped down to the teens, single digits in some cases. Same with the media. Go back and look at the Gallup polling from early 1970s to today on the media, plummeting. Trust in our banks, trust in the financial sector, plummeting. Trust in law enforcement, currently plummeting. So all of the institutions that we've historically relied on to hold the line for bridging trust, we've lost faith in. But here's even what's more concerning is the community trust, right? The trust we have in each other, in our neighbors. In 1972, Gallup took a poll and said one third of Americans don't trust their neighbor. That was actually one of the highest countries in the world, America was, in our ability to trust ourselves. Now, Two thirds of Americans say that they don't trust their neighbor and that number is climbing, especially with what's happened in the last six months. So we're now seeing unprecedented distraction, disengagement, distrust. And again, it's all around this spiral into the churn 2.0. It's all in this bonding trust. We're moving from bridging to bonding. Okay, we're circling wagons with people who look like us, believe like us, because we are afraid. We're afraid from a status perspective, from a safety perspective, and a resources perspective. And that's what humans do when they get afraid. We revert back to our group because that's where we're safest. And we abandoned what we've built over these decades. Now, what is the cost of that to you and me, right? Moving along from 1972 until the last six months, I would estimate the cost is primarily in the realm, if you could bring it over here, of organizational friction, organizational fracturing, and organizational erosion, right? So there was this steady decline in efficiency and speed and our ability to get things done as a collective at every level, but we were still moving. We were still moving forward. We were still achieving things. It was just less than it was before. And we noticed it, but we couldn't quite put our finger on it. All right. Now, what I want to do is ask Mark to bring that piece up, and I'm going to pivot into the last six months. Hopefully, what I've built for you is a picture that really, starting in 1972, you know, started to change dramatically. And in the last six months, we're now dealing with some stuff that we've really got to pay attention to. I hope you're with me now because this is that crossroads that I was talking about. This is the place where you and I have to dig in and we have to look and decide what are we going to hand our kids. And I do believe it's binary. I do believe it's either bridging trust or bonding trust. We have to decide. Okay. And, and what I want to show you before we get into this, I want to ask you a question. I'm going to get Jamie to bring the poll EV up and I'd like you to speak to the last six months. And I'd like you in your own word or two to describe trust. How are you feeling about connection and trust with your fellow citizens since COVID struck six months ago? Go ahead and give us your thoughts on that. Um, and and it's you the can same provide, thing. Yeah, you can provide your answers at pollev.com slash rooftop L118. And I did drop that link in the chat box so you can just click over if that's easier for you. Awesome, you guys, just keep it going. Uh, let's see what's going on there. Cause I wanna see once again, this is where we get a sense of each other, right? I'm seeing concerned, I'm seeing struggle, adrift, lowest ever, right? Alone in all caps, worried, very disappointed by some, encouraged by others. Um, anemic, wow, that's powerful. Afraid to share, large majority there as well alone. And you see as this thing just continues to populate, scared. That's the last six months, right? Tribal. And the reason that I want to get this out there is I want to hear from you. I want you to populate what the last six months has looked like for you as a collective. And again, I'm reminding people here that we have people from all different ethnicities. We have people from different religions. We have people from different countries, right? We have people uh, from different organizations, socioeconomic status. There's a lot of diversity in this room. But if you look at what's populating on the screen here, it's pretty consistent. It's, it's pretty unprecedented what we've seen in terms of social tension 
over the last six months, right? And we could let this play out all night and I guarantee you it would continue to follow this trend. All right, so now let's come out of that and I wanna look at the last six months and I wanna try to maybe give a little bit of structure to you all that will help you get your head around this. And we need to focus in on me on the board here, guys. Um, so the last six months, there have been three pervasive challenges that I believe will help you understand why you typed those words in, right? That we haven't necessarily been conscious of. One is there has been a persistent threat that you have faced that is COVID over the last six months that we've never experienced. We've never experienced a pandemic. We've never shut the world down. We've never watched our businesses cave. We've never friggin' like watched movie theaters shut down. I mean, are you shitting me? I'm sorry, but like, that's crazy. But it happened and it happened to us. And, and, and so we've become used to it now, but it's, it's really rough, right? It's a person, we worry about our parents. We worry about people like Romy Camargo, whose immune system is compromised, right? A warrior who's fighting for his country and, and now he can't even go outside. That persistent threat is real. We also face a ton of uncertainty. So many of you parents, you had to have your kids home from school. They came home for spring break, and then you got the word they're not going back to school. That's sporty. Anyone plan for that one? Right? Uncertainty. You're having to go to a 13-week cash flow in your business. You never expected to have to do that. Right? Complete chaos in the market. And, and it's still uncertain. And humans don't do well in chaos. We don't do well in uncertainty. And finally, isolation. Isolation because of this, um, this social distancing, right? And I hear it all the time on the corporate Zoom calls and the WebEx calls. It's like, this is awesome. We could do work from home forever. In fact, we're probably going to. And it looks like that it's so sad on their faces because very few people really mean that they want to work from home for the rest of their lives isolated from the world. We're all trying to make ourselves feel better in a lot of ways, but let's face it, we are social creatures. We have survived every episode in our existence, right, because of our ability to group and form teams. And now all of a sudden we can't. And that has deep, visceral, biological implications. There is a recent CDC study that shows 40% of adults surveyed state they now have uh, mental health problems as a result of social distancing, 40%. That's three times higher than what we saw before the pandemic. And that's just six months, right? So now I just wanna make that case that what we're, and, and then when you add to it the, the, the triggers, the things that happened with George Floyd and other examples of social injustice issues, all of a sudden, you have, instead of these churn twisters, you have a sinkhole that opens up. And in that sinkhole, organizationally, bodies are just falling into that sucker, man, right? It opens up, there's been all this erosion and fracturing over decades, and all of a sudden now, stuff is burning. Stuff is on fire. Things are just radically different in terms of how we're treating each other. Organizations are opening up like a sinkhole in Florida. And I don't know how else to describe it, but look around at some of the episodes that have happened in the last six months. Hasn't been consistent, but it has happened, right? And so now I'm calling this churn 3.0, right? Now what we have is distraction at a whole new level where everybody's heads down in their phone because there's nothing else the hell to do, right? More people are watching streaming content than at any point in history. Right? We're all in our phones. We also have huge disengagement. And let me get specific on that one. In a recent Harvard study, 48% of millennials say the American dream is dead. That kind of disengagement. And then finally, I believe distrust has moved to contempt. We are now showing a contempt for each other that is typically reserved for our enemies. Right? So what I'd like to ask you now and by the way, we're probably going to bust an hour, right? Because I want to get to some solutions for you. So we're probably going to bust an hour. If you have to jump, I understand. My recommendation is you get the rerun, you get the, you get the link, and you watch this thing. Because what we're going to land on at the end 
is what can be done, right? Um, so, Jamie, I wanted, uh, now that we've covered the last six months, and I believe leaders, all of you watching this, these three things that I just stated, persistent threat, uncertainty, and isolation, any one of those would make your life squirrely and accelerate distrust and the churn. You add all three, it is truly the perfect storm, right? But that's not what worries me. What worries me is the next six months. What worries me is a national election where human behavior is unlike anything I've seen in the United States around an election. What worries me is all this talk about a second wave of both flu and COVID, regardless of whether or not you believe it, that's gonna have a massive impact. And then finally, ongoing social distancing. No end in sight with that one, it seems in some ways. So tell me, let's bring up the screen again. How do you characterize the next six months? I'm just curious. I wanna know how you're feeling about the next six months that we're gonna to have to lead through together, right? Just give us a sense, if you would, type your answers in there and let's kind of get a sense of where that is. All right, skeptical, concerned, unimpressed, very worried, wary, okay, chaotic. Rise of the introverts, <laughs> again, wary, stressed. And what I would point out is that you've already run a lot of miles over the last six months that has an, a cumulative effect on your emotional temperature right? Um, and I'm glad that some of you are feeling optimistic and I'm glad that you're seeing opportunity because here's the thing I want to share with you. I am too, because I intend to actually bridge through this. I intend to actually move beyond the churn. And I think it's actually like someone is saying right here, time to step up, right? Uh, there, there is a lot of distrust. There are things to worry about, but only if we stay in the bleachers and wring our hands. All right. So thanks for populating this. Let's go ahead and pull it back out to me. And what I'll bring it to right now, as, as they change out here, is that the risk over the next six months, in my estimation, is that if fracturing and friction and erosion were our concerns at churn 2.0, right? And we saw in churn 3.0 over the last six months, a couple of sinkholes. What I'm worried about over the next six months, you all, if we stay on course of what we're doing as leaders, is organizational collapse right, where sinkholes are opening up at all kinds of different levels, particularly in our communities, right? And I want to read to you something that Sebastian Younger says in his book, Tribe, about the importance of community as we lead forward. Younger says, there are many costs to modern society, starting with its toll on the global ecosystem and working one's way down to its toll on the human psyche. But the most dangerous loss may be to community. If the human race is under threat in some way that we don't yet understand, it will probably be at a community level that we either solve the problem or fail to, right? So we've got to watch and protect against the collapse of our organization, the collapse of our businesses, collapse of our nation, the collapse of our communities. And we have to fight for that. And the reason that I state that is I don't believe that anybody else is coming right now. So what I wanna to do to wrap this thing up, and I'm gonna to try to step through them pretty fast, is I wanna throw out at you um, a couple of objections that I've heard about what I've put out here, followed by some suggestions on the way forward, okay? So my promise to you is I'm gonna to try to move through this in the next 10 to 15. I'm gonna step through it pretty efficiently, but I wanna lay it out there. And again, if you have to drop, I do hope that you'll come back here and get these points. And we'll also send them out as fully completed PowerPoint deck so that you have it. So the first objection I get is from, is a lot of people who were my teachers in high school. Uh, my parents have said this, other people, and they say this, is the people who really need to be watching this are the politicians and the media. They're the ones that are violating this. All right, I, I don't disagree with that, but let me ask you a question. When's the last time that you heard a politician or a member of the media take the microphone and actually utter a responsible statement about anything affiliated with bridging beyond one's in group. When's the last time? Go back and look, through, look and see if you can find it. The, the reason I'm telling you this is they already know this. Most of your politicians and media leaders understand 
bonding trust and bridging trust very well and they're backstroking it like it's their swimming pool in their backyard. They understand it fully. In fact, I would submit to you, if you look carefully at the media and carefully at politics these days, they are intentionally moving away from a bonding trust, bridging trust dynamic in order to foment instability in advancement of their agenda within their circle. Look around and see if you don't see it through that filter. The people late to the party, that's you and me. We're the people who don't fully understand the difference between these two trust levels. And we just happily go along unfriending each other on Facebook in an arena that has been contrived by somebody else. And that's my honest belief on how this thing is playing out. So I don't subscribe to the notion that we pin this on the politicians. Yes, they need to go. Yes, so many in the media need to go. But that's up to us as responsible citizens who understand at a binary level the two worlds and we don't po tolerate politicians who don't bridge to a vision bigger than their end group. And if we, if we put all of our faith in that politician or that media leader or that named leader, and we know that they willingly do not bridge, then it's, we're putting all of our faith in something that is going to cause a swing the other way, just like the pirate ride at the fair. It's just going to keep doing that. It's up to us and civilians at how we show up and how we understand those two worlds and what we demand of our leaders over time. All right, the second objection that I hear all the time is this system is rigged and it's only for a few groups. Okay, the first thing that I will say to that, is, or, or maybe like this is white nationalism at play or this is some group at play. And what I would ask you to remember is that what I'm coming at you with right now is as a, a combat veteran, another underrepresented voice, okay? And what I'm putting forward here is that that narrative of that is actually in my in my mind that is that is narrative warfare that is being put forward from a bonding trust arena right these two systems are agnostic it's up to the will of the people and how they're applied now with that said i will agree with you that there are a lot of people who are left out of this system my friend lenny bruce and my the co-star of my play last out Lenny's grant, Lenny fought 23 years in special forces, Iraq, Afghanistan, African-American, right? His father fought in World War II, came home from the war, escorting German prisoners. The German prisoners ate inside in a restaurant. Lenny's granddad's ate outside. Before Lenny left the military, he faced racism in it, even in his final days, right? Um, veterans are killing themselves in the parking lots of VAs. So I get it. There's a lot of work to be done. But what we have to ask ourselves is where are we best suited to advance our goals in a bridging trust environment where we bridge beyond our in-groups and reciprocity occurs at a biological level or where we overtly fight at a resource scarcity and status fear-based behavior level that we know by definition is unstable. Right? So we have to decide how we're going to show up for that. And this narrative that it's rigged for a few I don't disagree that there is, there is exclusion, but it's up to us to make it inclusive and in how we lead through that and using this kind of language to do it. Number three objective is that this kumbaya stuff will get my throat slit. I had an Iraqi war veteran who's part of my rooftop community say that to me when he first came in. And my response to that is I heard the same thing from Green Berets in 2009 when we decided to move from our overt targeting dressed like RoboCop that didn't work for 10 years into a more village-based approach of working by, with, and through locals. By the way, that's what Green Berets have actually been doing since World War II, where our origin started. So why in the most violent places on earth would Green Berets choose to lead with rapport building and human engagement, this kind of stuff, instead of shooting their way into the communities if the latter worked better? And so that's my response to you here, too. The bottom line is Daniel Coyle says in his book, Culture Code, that leaders have to lead with vulnerability. If you want to move your people to action, if you want to bridge across your end group, you want body armor to come down, you have to signal that you're willing to do that. I'm not saying you get your throat cut. You still have to have red lines of what you stand for and what you believe in, and you have to be willing to defend those. 
But let's all relook our behavior over the last six months. Let's remember the emotional temperature thing that happens to us unwittingly. And let's ask ourselves if we could revisit how we approach another human being and are we signaling a level of vulnerability that just brings the emotional temperature down? That's all I'm saying. And there's training that we can do to address that. The next one, and I got this one today and it's very disturbing to me. It was a comment from a friend of mine in New York City who's a business owner. I'll call him Calvin. And Calvin said this, change really isn't probably possible without a civil war. I'm going to be honest. I typically, I'm hearing that language a lot. I'm seeing a lot of veterans going high order when they hear that. And I understand why. When I hear that kind of language, it is typically spoken by people who have never heard the crack of a round in combat or held their friend in their final moments. And if we start using that kind of language in this country, then we are on a course that we cannot stop. And veterans know this. And so I do not subscribe to that notion at all even though we are at some points at this episodic violence, it's because there is an irresponsible display of leadership. And I'm not waiting for other leaders to step in and do that. I'm calling it out now and we need to start calling that out. Use of language like civil war and insurrection, regardless of the group, is irresponsible. And as a person who spent more than one tour of duty in countries with civil wars, the outcome is so predictable, it's laughable. And so we need to police ourselves up and really get clear on that. Which leads to other people saying, okay, Scott, what's your angle on this then, man? Everybody has an angle. What's your angle? And my angle is what I actually call the veteran's dilemma. In my play, Last Out, towards the end of the play, it's a play about a Green Beret sergeant named Danny Patton who um, is, is trying to find his way back home after the longest war in its nation's history. And toward the end of his career, He's having a heated argument with his wife, Lynn, who's been with him through thick and thin because his son just told him that he's joining the army and going to fight the war that Danny couldn't finish. And Lynn is like, Danny, please just, just come home, right? Just come home and just be home. And Danny's looking around at a society that he doesn't even recognize anymore. And he says, I'm going to tell you something. Dying for your country is one thing. I am fully prepared to do that but I have no clue how I'm supposed to live for it. And that is exactly the veteran's dilemma today. I borrowed those lines from Sebastian Younger, and I believe that they speak to exactly what we're dealing with today when it comes to this problem set. And I wanna share it with you right now. Today, veterans come home to find that although they're willing to die for their country, they're not sure how to live for it. It's hard to know how to live for a country that regularly tears itself apart along every ethnic and demographic boundary. Younger, a war correspondent, goes on to say, I know what coming back to America from a war zone is like. I've done it so many times. First, there's a kind of shock at the level of comfort and affluence that we enjoy. Sound familiar? Right there. But that is followed by the dismal realization that we live in a society that is basically at war with itself. People speak with incredible contempt about, depending on their views, the rich, the poor, the educated, the foreign born, the president, or the entire US government. It's a level of contempt, and please hear me on this, that is usually reserved for enemies in wartime, except that now it's applied to our fellow citizens. Unlike criticism, contempt is particularly toxic because it assumes a moral superiority in the speaker. Contempt is often directed at people who have been excluded from a group or declared unworthy of its benefits. Contempt is often used by governments to provide cover for torture. Contempt is one of four behaviors that statistically can predict divorce in married couples. People who speak with contempt for one another, younger ends, will probably not remain united for long. Here's what I equate it to. This is what I believe. 
is I'm sitting in a foxhole in Afghanistan. The sun is going down right now, and I'm in a perimeter line with a platoon of infantry, and we are holding the thin line against a Taliban onslaught that is outnumbering us five to one. And as the sun is sinking in the sky, we see the entire Taliban force flanking to the right. And we know that in just a few minutes, as we watch them scurry up that ridge line, they're gonna get online and they're gonna sweep across us with everything they have, and it will take everything we have to hold the line. And just as they get ready to launch and the whistles blow and they're moving, I tap my foxhole buddy on the shoulder and I slap the shit out of him for being Hispanic. And then I turn over here and I slap Karen for being a sheep. And then we just start slapping the shit out of each other all the way down the line while the flank moves. That may seem comical. It may seem laughable. But when veterans have gone off and defended a system of individual freedom and experienced bonding trust in its ugliness and then watch it on display when they come home. It is utter madness. And veterans know it. They know the outcome of this. And more importantly, they know that there are external and internal threats in this country of every nationality, of every origin, of every color, of every belief, salivating and sharpening their knives right now, watching everything we're doing. And they have a new strategy. Would you like to know what it is? Don't do anything, baby. Just let it play and go in and pick up what's left. And if we think that we are not in that shared outpost as a society, we are deluded. And that is what we are handing our kids. We are handing our kids a mechanism that is built on the most primal form of competition around group dynamics and not individual trust. And that's why veterans are so up here on this thing. And what I'm asking all of you as you watch this is to consider the wisdom in the veteran voice right now. And to all of my veteran brothers and sisters, I'm begging you, come back up out of the mountains. I know what you're watching right now, but we need you leading. We don't need you going to ground. Because like you, I don't want to watch it either. But we need to lead through this, and we need to recognize what the veteran dilemma is. Now, some of you might be saying, okay, great, but what, what, what can be done? I mean, I'm one person. What can I do? And what I will offer to you is what I call Putnam's Proof. In his book, Bowling Alone, at the end of the book, he has a, set, a chapter called Better Together. And Putnam says that in, in, in the early, uh, late 1800s, the late 1880s until the 1920s, it was hard times in the country. There was churn. There was um, a move from agrarian to industrialism, the haves and the have-nots, the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers were clicking along with high wealth while most folks had nothing. There was massive immigration that was just uncontrollable and the cities were sweltering and crime was up and the infrastructure couldn't hang. And the pundits were saying the end is near. And a group of people across the country looked around and said, okay, I guess no one's coming. And a guy named Dr. Bob and Bill W said, well, then that, I guess that means no one's gonna help with alcoholism. No one's going to help with my drinking problem. So let's just start AA, me and you. What do you say? And one alcoholic after another came through the doors. And years later, today, millions of people in AA, including this guy right here, 20 years sober, because of what two men did in that time period. But it wasn't just Alcoholics Anonymous. It was the Shriners. It was the Kiwanis. It was the Elks Club. It was the NRA, the NAACP, the Junior League, Future Farmers of America. In fact, every social organization that you knew as a child was pretty much formed during this period. And it was the largest grassroots movement in our country's history, a grassroots movement of bridging trust, of bridging social capital that lasted all the way to 1972 when we started to see that erosion. That, what started that 
what it came from all the way back in the late 1890s. So there is a collective precedent in this country for this kind of grassroots movement, this kind of grassroots leadership. And this was before social media. This was before we could do what we're doing right now, before we could check in with each other instead of unfriending each other on Facebook. We could use this platform to do 10x what happened in this time period. And so if you ask me, okay, then what can I do? I'll give you just a couple of things that you can do right now. One, reattune to your arena. Tonight, tomorrow, I want you to look at your arena and I'm gonna give you a few miracle questions you can ask yourself as you go through this. Look at your arena, look at your business, look at your family, look at your friendships, look at your country, look at your children and ask yourself, all right, how did we get here? How did we get here? What happened? And we should start asking ourselves that question. When all of the stuff happened with George Floyd, my best friend, Lenny, Lenny Bruce came in and we sat down for hours and I just asked him, Lenny, what am I missing, man? How did we get here? What, what if we did more of that? What if we asked questions that helped us get a better sense of our community and what's happening with true discovery and true curiosity? And we just shut up and listened and asked thoughtful, open-ended questions. Now that may sound kumbaya to you, but it's actually how we turned things around in Afghanistan in 2010. It's actually how elders started going to rooftops and fighting back. And I believe it's actually the first step we need to do now. Reattune to your arena. Take the new lens you have and try it and see if you don't see those environments different. Number two, decide to bridge. This has to be a conscious binary choice between two environments. Both exist and the outcome for ease is not set yet. But you have to decide where are you going to fall on that, right? And ask yourself this very simple question. Starting tomorrow, how am I going to treat people outside my group? It's a simple question. How am I going to treat people? For the most part, it costs you nothing. And most of our emotional temperature issues are because we are treating people the way they're treating us. And it is a reciprocity thing that's taken us high order. Number three, communicate a vision of bridging trust wherever you lead. If that's in your family, if that's in your PTA, if that's in your community, your classroom, if you're a business owner, a team leader, communicate to your people what your vision of bridging trust is. You have a new language, use it. And just ask yourself, where can I start to build a vision of bridging trust? Where can I start to communicate a vision of bridging trust? The next step in that, number five, number four, excuse me, is model it. Just model it in your day-to-day -day behavior. I tell people this all the time. I tell my boys this all the time. Leadership starts with you. If we can't lead ourselves, we can't lead anybody else. And we have to model what human engagement needs to look like, right? And so just ask yourself this very simple question. The next time you're in an engagement, how can I get this person ready to listen? What is it that I can do that will help them get ready to listen to me? And if they're not ready to listen, then stop talking. Ask questions, bring their emotional temperature down, and then when they're ready to listen, you'll know. And if it gets to the point where it's just chirping, just walk away, right? Just disengage. Don't let your emotional temperature suffer from that. So how we model this behavior in our day-to-day -day is everything. And think about the exponential effects that could have if we start leading with that. Number five is you got to train. The stuff I'm talking about, this isn't just instinct. This is decades and decades of work and synthesis. And whether you agree with it or not, at least it's a framework to engage. Now you have to train. What are you, how are you going to listen better? How are you going to use story and narrative to communicate? How are you going to be present in those moments where everyone's physical posture is combative? How can you be present in such a way that just your attunement, just your breath brings the emotional temperature down? That takes training. Green Berets train on that. We have to train on that because we're at that unprecedented crossroad. We have to train on that kind of stuff. And I encourage you to train with us at Rooftop. And I'll end on that. Finally, um, you got to reattune to your arena all the time. It's always changing. 
There's always stuff going on in your arena. Ask yourself, am I in a bridging trust arena right now? Or am I in a bonding trust arena? Because my promise to you is whether, wherever you stand on this, you're not going to be able to unsee it. When you turn on the news tomorrow when you get in Facebook, you're welcome. You're going to have a new lens. So reattune. Where am I in this? Where is the room on this? Leadership's the management of energy, yours and others. So understanding your operational environment, that's the first special ops imperative. Use it because it's relevant to your life. Just reattune and avoid the churn. I tell my teachers this from high school. I tell my mom this. I'm telling all of you, if you think that social media is like the, you know, the honorable forum to like win the day on your agenda, you are being played. You're being played. We're not using that platform the way we could use it as leaders. And I'm just going to leave it right there. My recommendation is if you see yourself being torn into a churn twister, step away from it. Because as Lawrence of Arabia says in his 27 articles in 1917, avoid tribal conflict. You lose all credibility. If you want to bridge and be a catalyst, you cannot get sucked into those churn twisters. Avoid it. And look for a better opportunity to bring emotional temperature down. And then when they're ready to listen, you engage. Don't just run in the red at an emotional temperature and get sucked in. And finally, connect. I'm asking you to connect with a tribe of rooftop leaders. There are people in this room. There's still 120 some people on this webinar right now. And I love that. There's 121 people. And these aren't, these are like leaders, man. I mean, CEOs, uh, community influencers, soldiers, stay at home parents. Like, well, I guess we're all stay at home parents now, aren't we? Crap. All right. But you get the idea. Right, this is a room of people with very diverse opinions, but this is where we can bridge. Let's go shoulder to shoulder right here because what I will tell you is rooftop leadership, what our mission as a result of this crossroads is we're putting 10 million, that's right, 10 million inspired rooftop leaders into the arena to defeat the churn and to create bridging trust environments in their arena. That's what we're doing, that's our mission. And I really, really want you to be a part of it. Whether that is going to our website, rooftopleadership.com, we have a ton of free stuff there. Vlogs, stuff on how to make better connections, use it. There's crisis leadership stuff. Another option is uh, leading through the chaos. This little book right here is great for dealing with the crisis situations. And if that second wave comes, I'm telling you, it's a wonderful handbook. 25% of the proceeds go to veterans. And finally, our Rooftop Leadership Live. That one is the thing I'm most proud of. It's virtual. If this resonated with you, we're going to spend three days in a virtual environment training on how to use that high stakes engagement process, how to be a better listener, how to use narrative competence, and how to be present in the churn. All about getting as relevant as you can to build that bridging trust. Years and years of work in training you on this. Jamie, I'm not even going to speak any more about it. Jamie will drop the link in there. It's going to be a hundred really, really talented leaders. A lot of them in this room go in there and sign up. Uh, there's a discount code that we'll do for it. It's super well priced anyway. Uh, but regardless of whether you come to that and train or use our free stuff, my ask is just that you train and that you use this content to the best of your ability because we need you to lead us. And when you do, I'll see you on the rooftop where a new movement is gathering to fight the churn. I'll see you on the rooftop where you'll stand shoulder to shoulder with people who bridge above all else. I'll see you on the rooftop where people follow you, not because they have to, because they choose to. I'll see you on the rooftop. Thank you and good night.